Hi, everyone. This is America Adapts, the climate change podcast. Hey, Adapters. Welcome back to another exciting episode. It's a recap of 2023. Yes, I know it's 2024, but I was running a bit behind and recording this early in 2024. I used to do these type of episodes every year, but sometimes I get behind and I'm not able to put it together. But I'm thrilled to announce we have an episode highlighting the top climate stories of 2023 and some of the episode highlights for America Adapts. Joining me is Anita Van Breda of World Wildlife Fund, Monica Serrano of Turner Construction, and Jessica Meterson of the law firm Stafford Rosenbaum. We all pick our top climate stories of 2023 in some of our favorite America Daps episodes. Also, two very short bonus interviews. Dr. Rufilfe Mofoke, a professor from South Africa, joins the podcast to talk about her new podcast focusing on plastics and what they mean for the marine environment. And finally, Stephen Robert Miller, an independent journalist, joins the pod to discuss his new book, Over the Seawall, Tsunamis, Cyclones, Drought, and the delusion of controlling nature. I love these episodes. I get to relax and have fun conversations with my colleagues and friends and highlight some of our favorite podcast moments from the year. I hope you enjoy. Before we get started, I want to give you a heads up on the next Patel Innovations in Climate Resilience Conference, or ICR24. Patel is presenting their third annual Innovations in Climate Resilience Conference with the theme Solutions for Scaling Change that captures the urgency and growing need for innovations at scale to meet the monumental task of addressing climate change. The conference will take place this year, April 22nd to April 24th in Washington, D.C. ICR24 will gather innovators across industry, academia, and government. This is the second ICR that I'll be covering for Patel. We partnered on an episode for ICR24. CR23 in Columbus, Ohio, and I'm excited to announce a continuation of that partnership. The themes of the conference are mitigation, sustainability, and yes, adaptation. ICR is your opportunity to join scientists and researchers from academia, industry, and government working at the forefront of climate innovation. Visit patel.org forward slash adapt to learn more. That's patel.org forward slash adapt. Links are in my show notes. Support for America Adapts comes from Battelle, where science and technology are applied to help create a safer, healthier, and more resilient world. Okay, let's look at 2023 in this year in review episode with some adaptation all stars. Hey, Adapters, I truly, and I mean this, have an exciting episode. Joining me is Anita Van Breda of World Wildlife Fund, Monica Serrano of Turner Construction, and Jessica Meterson of the law firm of Stafford Rosenbaum. Hey, guys, welcome to the podcast. Hello. Hi. Hi, Doug. All right. We got quite a crew here. It's going to be kind of difficult to manage things, but I'll I'll try my best. I haven't done this end of the year episode, and as people notice, we're actually in 2024, but we're finally getting to it, but relatively early. So this is great. And we did a mid-year episode about a year and a half ago. And so I'm so excited to have you guys on. We have a routine for this. This is sort of, in some ways, a victory lap for America DAP. So it's just indulge us, but we like to have some fun with it. But first off, I want you guys to introduce yourselves. Some of them, my listeners are familiar with you guys from being on for multiple episodes, but we have to just introduce ourselves and some of the work that you do. And let's just go alphabetically here. Anita, tell us about yourself. Thanks, Doug. Anita Van Breda, Senior Director for Environment and Disaster Management at World Wildlife Fund based in Washington, D.C. I'm part of our adaptation and resilience team, but my work focuses on extreme events primarily weather events, but also conflict and the relationship between those events, climate and nature. Excellent. Anita and I, I think it's been five or six episodes now, independent of Sean that you and I've worked on. So you are the gold standard in the world and America Daps. Okay, Jessica, who are you? So my name, yeah, I am Jessica, obviously. I'm a partner at Stafford Rosenbaum, which is a Wisconsin uh, law firm. I live here in Madison. I actually came up here from Texas about 12 years ago. I've been a business litigator for over two decades now, you know, always cared about climate change, but thought, all right, I'm just a regular business litigator, companies fighting, what can I do? But over a decade ago, I started getting into construction litigation and then, Now, six or seven years ago, I started working on a major infrastructure dispute involving multiple cities, engineers, you know, contractors, DOT, all that sort of thing. And as part of that, I started to learn and working with my experts that the problems on the job site may have been related to climate change and basically changing extreme weather events and also, you know, wider variations in groundwater tables here and the impacts that has on infrastructure. So I actually then during COVID, there was a webinar. Monica was a speaker on the webinar and I reached out to her and we have been working together ever since. 
my focus, and Monica can talk about hers, is about climate change and how it can actually impact the built environment. And I always like to describe myself as like the ghost of Christmas future. Like if you don't listen to us, if you don't listen to Monica's advice, America, DAPS, other experts' advice, you will be dealing with a lawyer like me. And I always like to say that a lot of my clients love to tell me that they don't like lawyers. So I kind of give them the either or, either start, you know, accepting that climate change is real and you need to adapt and prepare for it. Or you can hire a lawyer like me afterwards to have massive, expensive litigation over the problems that result. I got a new byline. Listen to America adapts or hire a lawyer. So something like that. Yeah, I like that. All right. Monica. Monica Serrano, Resilience Program Manager for Turner Construction. I'm a mechanical engineer by trade. I work for in the, in the construction industry my entire career. We started having a focus on sustainability, mostly on the forms of LEED, you know, the building certification 20 years ago. But about five years ago, my team of one person started growing. And essentially, we are now are um, a whole team, and I'm the dedicated person for climate adaptation and resilience. So I support my company at a national level, supporting our clients incorporate climate resilience into their buildings, increase the resilience of our job sites and our operations. Think of supply chain and anything that has to do with, you know, how we operate day by day. Most recently, I became a podcaster along with Jessica. She forgot that part of her bio. We really I didn't want to steal your thunder. I feel you should get to talk first. It's all good. No, we just launched. <laughs> this is a shameless plug for our just very, very new podcast, Adapt Climate Change in the Built Environment. Excellent. Congratulations. I was going to just prompt you like some exciting news that you guys had to share, but there you guys shared it. So you can obviously weave that in later on with some of your answers if you felt that was relevant. So yes, congratulations. Competition. Thanks. Can we also give a thanks to you? You have been like our mentor and our guru on this whole podcasting journey. So we have to give thanks to the OG adapter podcaster, right? So thank you, Doug. Well, let's spend maybe 15 minutes on this. Let's keep going. Let's, let's, <laughs> let's, let's, let's I get think you started. should add to your bio our... consultant. That's right. right. Um, yes, because you have helped us a lot. So thank you so much for that. It's actually on my website, I, I, <laughs> the podcast consultant. So, but you guys were special. I'm very excited that a new adaptation podcast is out there. Someone I can destroy in my diabolical ways. And so no, I'm <laughs> kidding. Check it out. We'll have links in all the show notes and such. What we're going to do here is we're going to put, I do this in these episodes. I have someone take over because I can relax, although I never really relax, is that Jessica is going to be the host. Jessica, I'm handing it over to you. Take control. You can bully us if you want. Let's have some fun. Let's start off. Again, as you pointed out, Doug, this is really mainly a retrospective on 2023. So let's talk about 2023 and what we saw as like the top three climate stories of the year for climate, climate change, climate adaptation, that sort of thing. Anita, let's start off with you. What's what's uh, some of the stories that you saw out there? Well, because my work focuses primarily on extreme events. Of course, I'm watching disasters of all kinds all year long, and there's Ooh. a never-ending stream of them. So, of course, some of the extreme events from last year, and in particular, I think the wildfire in Hawaii stuck out to me just because it's U.S. domestic. Most of my work is international. So really looking at what's happening within my own country and learning from those experiences. I'm often challenged with this work to help people understand how much of these extreme events are due to climate and climate change versus so many of the other issues that present vulnerability and add up to risk for people. So that's an interesting th thing for me to have to better understand myself and then share with the people that we work with, which are primarily humanitarians in the disaster management communities. It's interesting that you mentioned the Hawaii wildfires because wildfires was also one of my top climate stories of the year. But I was actually thinking more about the Canadian wildfires, mm -hmm. partially because it did have a direct impact kind of on you know, areas that are more in within my professional realm in the sense of, and Monica and I have talked about this and her company was one of the companies that handled this better, but the idea of outside workers, right? That because of the wildfire smoke, 
how it's impacting people, how that ties into OSHA regulations, safety, all of that. But I thought the Canadian wildfires were interesting because they weren't happening here, right? They were actually happening somewhere else. But as we can see, that not only can wildfires have tragic impacts on the people, like in Hawaii, who are right there in the middle of the disaster, what we're now seeing with some of these disasters, too, is they can have massive impacts on people who are, what, hundreds or thousands of miles away. And I think especially, quite frankly, for people here in Wisconsin who sometimes think we don't need to worry about climate change. You know, we want it warmer. It's too cold. We don't need to worry about sea level rise. This is the sort of thing that shows, no, even here in Wisconsin, you can be directly impacted by climate change-related disasters that are happening elsewhere. So before we go on to another one from you, I want to hear, Doug, how about you? What's another, what's one of the top climate stories that you saw this past year? One of my top stories is, it wasn't a specific top story, but just heat coverage. This past summer, I thought the media really passed a milestone of covering extreme heat, tying it into climate change. Of course, they can always improve, but some of the national newspapers like New York Times, Washington Post, really great coverage, getting the right people talking about it, not being shy, trying to make those links to climate change as they did in the past. And quite frankly, I felt a little bit of pressure to cover extreme heat in, on the podcast in the summer, but I'm like, nah, no, nah, it's just saturated right now. And so I waited until the end of the summer and I did kind of a wrap up episode with Lad Keith at University of Arizona and Kelly Turner at UCLA, both heat experts. And it was just kind of an end of summer wrap up. So I, I was... Uh, encouraged by the the extreme heat coverage in the media. Yeah, that was that's a good one. Well, these are all good, obviously. Monica, how about you? The fact that 2023 was the hottest year by far, it exceeded all all projections. So it kind of tags along with Doug's Doug's response. That and for me too, heat was my other big obsession this year. Monica knows after living in Texas for 16 years, I hate the heat. So I was, a, I'm an early adopter of realizing that heat is bad before everyone else, even those of you who live down in Arizona, Doug, one of these days you'll realize that you need to be up here in Wisconsin. But yeah, and again, in particular, I thought it was interesting, the heat issue as it relates to my both my former state and my profession, right? Like the heat issues with outside workers. Texas, of course, had a real, that issue highlighted both in the press, Doug, to your point, but also in the legal realm, because you had both Austin and Houston putting in heat-related protections for workers, mandating rest breaks, you know, water breaks, that sort of thing. And Texas, of course, is a dysfunctional battle between the very conservative state government and some of the more liberal cities. And so Texas, this Texas state government actually put in what was called like Death Star legislation, which is basically their effort to prevent the more liberal cities from passing any sort of regulation that the state government doesn't like, which included these water breaks. So luckily, The case is still on appeal, but the district judge actually stopped that Death Star legislation because of the Texas Constitution, because it found the court found that the Texas state constitution provides a lot of what independence and control to the cities versus what the state can do to it. So that's ongoing. But I thought the extreme heat and in particular, both the focus on how it impacts outside workers, but also I think, and this is part of the coverage, Doug, I think you may have even discussed this. I like that podcast wrap up episode, but about obviously like the people who never get a break from it, the people who live in apartments and can't afford air conditioning, the people who have to stand on like scorched earth pavement waiting for the city bus to take them to work, then they may have to work outside. And so, yeah, the impact on people having to live in this heat, I thought was there was a real good focus on the dangers of that this year. Then let's go back around. Anita, what's your second climate story of the year? Well, you already touched on some of it, the multiple health impacts of different climate change. So really looking at the health community and and how they're adapting to this. And then one story that I really liked that I didn't see much about, maybe because it's towards the end of the calendar year, is the American Climate Corps and what that is about, what the plans are, how that's going to evolve. I'm looking forward to learning more about that next year or this year. Okay, kind of a spoiler, but I'm not familiar with that. What is that? Well, you have to listen to Doug's episode on that. because I must have missed that one. one. Shoot. No, that's one of my recommendations for the future. Now we're jumping ahead. (laughs) 
<laughs> All right. Hopefully Doug won't get mad at my hosting skills for that. I'll go listen to that episode. But thanks. So Doug, how about you? What's your next story? Well, it, it, it's not an episode yet, but what Andy was uh-huh. saying, I, I reached out to some folks who would be responsible and they told me circle back around in April, some of the CEQ folks. So they're still figuring out. I think it's landed in some agency, I think Department of Labor or something. Okay. So my second story is just completely overlaps with Monica's The Hottest Year on Record. I guess the criticism of the media in that I felt like starting in November, we're getting stories. This is probably going to be the hottest year on record. And then in early December, this is pr- likely to be. And so for like six weeks, is it going to be the hottest? Likely. People in the media in some ways just don't know how to tell a good story like Hollywood does. You just you need to really kind of sell it. And then, of course, the new year passes and everyone's like, of course it was, but we're waiting for the scientists to give us the go ahead. I think it was like January 8th where they're just like, it's official. It's the hottest year on record. And it's like, rah, rah, rah. and it seems like a missed opportunity. But I'm encouraged also that they did highlight it. And I, I just, I want to just make sure that we never ignore the fact next year might be the hottest year on record, but let's make a big deal about it every single year. That's not just something we can get used to. So yeah, just I agree with you, Monica. That was a big, big story. Yeah, I think that we become immune to it. And I'm not, I don't think I have the answer of how to communicate it successfully. But I, yes, I agree with you. All right. So what's your next story, Monica? My next story was the extreme rain in the Northeast and New England. Do you remember it was last summer? Maine, I think particularly in Vermont, there were some really crazy rain events. And just recently, I mean, this was January 2024, so it doesn't, it doesn't quite fit in the question. But you know, something I'm concerned about is the lack of snowfall, which, you know, happened carrying on to another piece of news. But it's the lack of snow up until now. New York City had 702 days without any snowfall. Wow. And recently I was reading about why that is a problem, right? We rely on snow in the summers that, you know, there isn't snow for water usage. So extreme rain when it's supposed to rain, extreme rain when it's supposed to snow leads to drought in the summer. Mm -hmm. Not interesting. So Anyway, the extreme rain that that we saw all the way, I mean, I don't know if you guys ran into the the piece of news of the New York City subway. It was the whole Northeast where there was just like water flowing all the way down to like where the trains are. And it's just becoming more, I feel like last year it happened more than a couple of times. Well, I already gave my two stories so far, so I won't do my third yet. So Anita, we'll circle back to you for your final climate story of 2023. What well, you covered all mine, the <laughs> climate core, the extreme heat and the extreme events. Oh, that's so right. I got my three in. Thank you. All right. Good job. Doug, how about you? I, I don't know if it should be elevated to top climate story of the year, but it's obviously relevant is that the Biden administration announced release something, this national resilience framework back in the fall. And I'm in the works of doing a whole episode on it with Jesse Keenan again. Jesse obviously is my ringer to dig into these reports. Even though it came out three, four months ago, it's going to be relevant for years ahead. And just a preview, I mean, Jesse obviously weighs in a lot of the more technical things. But if you look at it, there's not a heck of a lot there. And I think there's six objectives within the resilience framework, and not a single one really focuses on communication. And quite honestly, I feel like for the next couple of years, our main emphasis should be on communication. And Mm. The fact that they're not calling it a national adaptation plan, even though I know there's legislation out there, they could have aligned it with that. And of course, there's going to be a lot of good work that happens underneath that. But I just think, you know, it was well received in our circle, sort of, but it's just because we're all wonky adaptation and it's getting some attention. I'm going to dig into more of this in that episode, but there should be a national communication strategy. So, Monica, how about you? Mine were covered too. Oh. The wildfires and the smoke that, you know, covered at Northeast and the Midwest was one of my stories. Well, I'll add in my last one that is a personal obsession of mine along with heat is water. And generally, obviously, like the flooding, like we talked about that there was flooding, but also, you know, the Colorado River, like the whole, are they going to run out of water, that kind of whole panic, but then there was enough snow and enough rain to get them through this year. But it was also right this summer, Doug, I think they're in Phoenix where they said, look, we're not going to issue any more permits because we don't have enough water for new homes. You know, the New York Times has done a great job. They're doing kind of a series on aquifers and basically how like the Ogala Aquifer down in Kansas is about to run out of water, how my home state, Minnesota, because of 
It's, and this is both a combination of climate change related issues and this kind of industrial commercialized farming, the CAFO, the confined animal feed operations and things like that, that are basically even drying up Minnesota's aquifers. I think a lot of people, when they think climate change and they hear water, they think about rising sea levels. And to me, it's much more issues throughout the rest of the country and places where on the one hand, you'll have excessive flooding and the damages that can cause. But on the other hand, we're going to just be running out of enough water in a lot of areas and what that means. And I, I got to jump in on that if anybody else wants to is that I'm here in Arizona. And of course, that coverage was great. But you know, when you're here on the ground, this notion we're going to run out of water. I'm sorry, that's not necessarily the case. Like you look at the use by agriculture, right? It's ridiculous. And so because of these ridiculous Western water laws, Phoenix and Tucson are the big cities here. We have more than enough water for people here, even though Phoenix is so irresponsible. You go up there, they have trees like you're living in Wisconsin. It's so irresponsible. It's still plenty of water for Mm -hmm. the people here. There are pecan trees being grown in south of Tucson. There's cotton. There's alfalfa. It shouldn't be grown here, and it's using most of the water. And so when they say we're going to run out of water, well, we're going to run out of water if we indulge these agricultural interests. Maybe I'm going to hear from someone because of that. It's ridiculous. It's plenty for people. No, you're right. I mean, that is a huge issue. I remember in California, they talked about that as people were basically being rationed and couldn't get water for their homes. People were planting almond tree farms, right? And just drilling down deeper. No, and that's part of the problem here in the Midwest too. So moving on, let's focus on Doug and his podcast. And let's all talk about what our favorite episodes were of the year. So Nita, I'm going to circle back to you. What Give me, you know, just one to start with. What was one that you really liked? I have two on my list. The top one would be the extreme heat with Lad Keith and his colleague, because that is also something that keeps me up at night. Mm -hmm. I read Jeff Goodell's book, The Heat Will Kill You First. I saw Andy Revkin do a webcast on extreme heat and emergency management. And I feel like we're woefully unprepared for this from multiple perspectives throughout our society and around the world. And my community, who I work with, the emergency management community is really struggling with things in terms of early warning systems, how to deploy, how to prepare for extreme heat. We're just not there yet. So that's a big concern. So that was one of my top ones. Yeah, that was good. I'm going to do you last, Doug, for this, since this is your podcast. So I'm going to do uh, Monica next. What was one of your favorites? The episode highlighting the climate coach at the Washington Post, talking about communication I think how we communicate the need for climate adaptation and just climate change topics in general can make a big difference in what actions are taken. So the climate coach at the Washington Post is doing a fantastic job Mm -hmm. communicating climate change. So I like that episode a lot. That's a good one. I love the climate modeling one. What was it? The wild, wild west of climate modeling, because that's something Monica and I talk a lot about a lot as we're telling people that building codes need to change. Engineers need to be looking to the future. But as and I forget her name, but as a, I think it was a law professor, right, Doug, as she right. talked about Madison you know, London. Thank you. That's right. Thank you, Monica. You know, as she pointed out, it is still hard. How do you decide which of these models to use? How can you verify them? How can you trust them? So I thought that was a really interesting episode. And it's just, it's hard because there's no good answer yet, right? But sometimes those are the best episodes. They're like, here's this thing that we need to be thinking about. But yeah, there's no easy answer. Doug, how about you? What was one of your favorites of your podcast of the past year? Okay, let me qualify the hell out of this first. Uh, Like, let's park all the World Wildlife Fund. Of course, they were my favorites in their own way, right? And other people that feel like I'm picking in like a preference, but it it was really cool. I did a cultural history and adaptation episode in Trinidad and Tobago. I got to go to Trinidad. There's a place I thought I'd never go. And interesting, the people, I did some field trips that were super cool and just telling the stories of what they're doing there and bringing that sort of international adaptation. Because I, I do it on occasion. I get, you know, sass from Sean Martin of WWF. He still wants me to call it Earth Adapts and focus more on international issues. But mm-hmm. that was fun. I got to go to Trinidad and Tobago and just hear their stories. And it was such a diverse group of people. And the feedback on that episode was really nice. It was just something different. So I really enjoyed that. I'll give a shout out on that episode about the audio that you added. There was like water. It was like people walking on water. It seems like a small thing, but it kind of brought us to Trinidad with you. 
I'm going to just little correct. That was the mangrove episode in Mexico. Oh, shoot. That, oh, right. Everyone I'm sorry. Said you that. can edit that out. No, no, no. I like this because I've heard from multiple people. All I did was rec- I was in the mangrove squashing around with a group of WDF folks. And I'm just like, ah, I better get some sound. And then I hear, um, I'm blanking on her name, but one of the, the Mexican WDF staff, she says something in the distance, but you, there's, you can tell someone's there. Multiple people have said, oh, I felt like I was there with you. And that was after the fact. I overlaid it between interviews. So anyway, that was the Mexico one. <laughs> oh, well. Okay. Anita, how about another episode that you really like from 2023? Okay, I didn't pick this one, but I do want to also give a shout out to the Trinidad and Tobago. I did like that. And I think you had dug some Caribbean music or something in there. And having lived in the Caribbean, that kind of stuck with me. And I will also give you sass about not doing more international <laughs> Shows what you do. And when I tell invite people to come and join, I say this name is a misnomer. It's called America Daps, but he actually does international as well. I always have to qualify that for you, Doug. I'm just saying. But my second episode for this list was the, this might surprise you, Doug, the U.S. Department of Defense adapts to climate change. Worked with some DOD people. I think they're trying hard. They've got some good folks. It's a different way of thinking and looking at climate change, but I give them credit for being open about it. And I think Doug did a good job of kind of navigating some of the sensitivity. So I thought that one was interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's certainly, and I know that was an issue back when the Congress was GOP controlled, maybe it was during the early Bush years, and they literally banned like any discussion, right, of climate change. And the DOD, even back then, was like, we've got to be doing this. I mean, we've got naval bases that are vulnerable to climate, you know, to rising sea levels. We understand the turmoil this is going to cause. And yet the GOP was like, no, you are not allowed to even discuss or take into consideration any of that. Yeah, you can have opinions on what the military does. My son wants to be in the military, and we often discuss that. But um, they certainly realize that climate change is a serious, serious issue they need to be dealing with. So, okay, Monica, how about you? The recent episode on climate risk and insurance, I think you went to the conference that was organized by the uh, Environmental Defense Fund in American University. I thought it was like five episodes in one. There was so much good information in there. And it was a long episode too. Climate risk is a topic that naturally being immersed in the climate adaptation and resilience world, I have just, you know, been fascinated by climate risk and how it's evolving and how we will continue to evolve. So I thought that was a great, very insightful episode. Yeah, I will say I always like the insurance episodes. It was thanks to you, Doug, that I learned about and then Monica and I actually got to present with her, Dr. Carolyn Kuski, right? I bought her book, Disaster Insurance. I even had her autograph it when we spoke together. I do like to tell people a lot that, yeah, insurance does not seem like an interesting topic, but in the worlds we all operate in, they can play a really outsized role. So I always like your insurance episodes. That being said, and now it's going to sound like I'm making this up, but I came in with this as my other favorite episode. It was a Trinidad and Tobago one. Just because a lot of your episodes can get really heavy. That one, I thought it was just more fun, right? And yes, it was nice to feel like I'm down there in this fabulous island, but also to just talk to these people with this lived experience and talk about trying to preserve their culture and, you know, all the challenges they're going through was just really, it was so outside the scope of what I'm usually dealing with or thinking about, even when I'm dealing with climate change in my world, that I really enjoyed that. So, so yeah, so I'll jump on that Trinidad bandwagon. But Doug, coming back to you, is there another? Oh, sorry, Anita, did you want to say something? Uh, yeah, I was just going to jump in and say, what oh, does that yeah. say to you, Doug? The one, the top, one of the top episodes was the international one. Isn't that odd? WWF is going to make you go worldwide, Doug. It's clear. Well, no, I wish they would. Like Sean took me to Uganda and Kenya and, you know, we did Santa Cruz, Anita, but like We've done it remote lately. Let's get where when are we going to go to Fiji and all that. Let's start well, working as soon on that as episode. you <laughs> change the name of your podcast, <laughs> I'll get you a plane to. Oh, that's a problem. I guess. How about America Daps presents Earth Adapts. We'll have some sort of <laughs> like middle thing. Eh? You could have a season or something like that. Yes. Well, I will put a shout out to talking about water mitigation in the Netherlands. So if you have Ooh. some organization, I can send you there. That would be a good one. What is they it, have Deltaris or something? Deltaris? What's that? Is the group. Deltaris, is that the group there that does it? Anyway, go on. Sorry. I don't know. No, I don't know. But that, it would be a cool episode. Just water mitigation in the Netherlands. Doug's traveling the globe in 2024. I can see it. 
So, okay, Doug, we have not gotten your second. And it's okay. hard, yes. You're picking between all your children. We know you love all your children the same. But yes, if there was another one you wanted to give a shout out to today, what would it be? No, I don't love them all the same. Oh. And you'll, you won't hear that, though, because <laughs> I can't do that. I got to stay professional here. Well, first off, thanks. It just reminds me. And I just, I'm always reminded that this podcast, I'm going to talk a little bit here, but the insurance one, I released these ones. And Carolyn Kuski, I've done multiple episodes. She's so amazing and she has a great energy. But like, I'm like, oh, this yeah. is going to be wonky. No one's going to enjoy this. Some of the best feedback has come from that episode. And uh, yeah, those, those episodes are always so popular, even if they're long. And so I, every time I'm like, no, this is too long. Nah, people enjoy them. I like my reference episodes. And it was at the beginning of the year. And I worked and she was your first guest on your podcast, Shalini Vajhala. Mm-hmm. And she helped me create this episode around the Infrastructure Act. And so I had multiple people from cities. I had her on. I had the Brookings Institute. And I love providing those kind of reference episodes. And so sometimes they're not as sexy. I know they're just going to be used well in the feedbacks. Like, ah, oh, people start thinking and like people in the kind of trenches, it's useful information. So I, I, I love getting those episodes out there. And she was the mastermind behind that episode. I got on with her. I'm like, mm-hmm. this foundation gave me some money. And they said, do infrastructure. And they gave me no other guidance. And I'm like, what should I do? And so she had a vision because that's what she does for a living. And so... It it turned out really well. So I enjoyed that episode. All right. And let me take that as another opportunity to remind everyone that Monica and I have a podcast called Adapt Climate Change in the Built Environment. And yes, thanks to Doug. The first episode that was just released on January 17th is a great interview with Shalini. She is just incredible in every which way. So uh, yeah, so thanks for introducing us to her too. And that is a fun, fantastic episode, both the one she did with you and with us. Thank you, Jessica. I'm just resting back. You did a fantastic job. I had (laughs) Jessica take these two parts, but I'm going to go back because I've got some other questions that you can't even see here. Thank you. Fantastic job. Love the enthusiasm. And so what we're going to do as we kind of get to the, you know, other part of this episode is I want to talk about the future. And Anita, you sort of alluded to it earlier, and we're not going to have multiple ones, but I just want to ask each of you, where should I go with this? Even in the coming year or maybe even the next two or three years, and I guess international coverage will be part of your recommendation. But what what should I do? What am I missing? It's one way of asking about it. Anita, let's go with you. I want to say more attention Deliberate attention, not so much in the subject matters, Doug, that you cover going forward, although I have a few ideas on that, but to really help your listeners make the connection between the so-called dual crisis, between the biodiversity crisis and the climate change crisis, and really placing this issue of adaptation in the context of a systems approach. Because some of the things that Jessica and Monica were talking about earlier in terms of water management, in terms of the built environment It's all related. And we can't just attribute, for example, every stream of event to climate change. There are multiple things that create vulnerability and risk. The biodiversity crisis is one of many, but we have to, if we're going to be adapting into the future, we've got to adapt and address all of these together. And I don't know the answer to that, except to help people think through that whatever your sector is, whatever your discipline is, you are practicing it and it experiencing it within a system that we have to be mindful of, whether or not we have the ability to mandate the authority to address all this, few of us do, but how do we work together with others in order to take a systems approach to adaptation? And I see it in my work every day where we're trying to do the right thing by climate and then we do the wrong thing by nature, and that's not going to help us, and that's not going to address the extreme risks that we need to and compounding risks that we're going to be facing into the future. So good luck with that, Doug. (laughs) And if you do want to do a follow-up, I mean, there are a lot of big ideas there, but giving me episode titles on how you can kind of actually structure an episode around that, that's useful. Okay, this, and then maybe ideas for guests. That's how you kind of get like bring it down from covering these topics to how does it actually end up in an episode? So so you and I, we always talk. We talk every week. I'm going to go with Jessica. What should I be doing? This is actually kind of a follow-up to an episode I listened to that you released. Time has lost all meaning, but you had an episode where you were at a conference, I think, and talking to a lot of like Native American and tribal government leaders, right? Which I thought was good. I would be really interested in more focus on Native American and to Anita's point, going more worldwide, kind of more indigenous populations in some of the issues. But here in the U.S., like, again, in the 
in the Midwest, I'm actually involved in a case where we're helping a tribe basically try to protect its water resources from basically big egg. So there's a lot of issues with that. Obviously, the Navajo and how they've been treated with the whole Colorado River thing is a whole fascinating issue. So I think both that, you know, the Native American view of how all this works is very different from, I think, kind of the dominant view here in the U. I think that's interesting, but also then the work. They've also done great work, some of the Native American tribes out West, like with fighting to remove culverts and actually protect the salmon population as part of their treaty rights related to fishing. So I could give you like a lot of kind of topics uh, related to that. And also, I would love to hear from one of the tribes that actually got the money from Biden to relocate, right? I think there was $75 million that was distributed to three tribes. I want to say two maybe in the Pacific Northwest. I always forget if the third one's in Florida or where it is, but their reservation lands are so threatened by climate change that there was actually money allocated to them to help them relocate. And, you know, as we talk more about climate migration, they're really on the forefront of that. So I would love to hear an episode on how that's all going. Yeah, it's tricky to cover tribal issues and how you kind of that was San Diego. I went there for the climate that's science right. and like the summit there. And yeah, it was a big pep rally in a lot of ways, too. Monica. Here's a title. We humans stink at preparing for disasters. And I understand that it is in our psychology. So I think you should bring a psychologist and talk about how we're wired and that perhaps there is some reasoning on why we're not in including enough climate adaptation in our unconscious bias. There's a, a book I, I love called The Ostrich Paradox, Why We Underprepare for Disasters, written by a, an economist and a psychologist. So maybe... You can get that psychologist to America adapts. I have to look it up. Yeah, you just have to be careful with sometimes with, you know, psychologists, unless they're like really just, it sounds like they're grounded in the issue of climate adaptation, though. I mean, I would want to just really frame it very closely in that regard. So I know the title sounds very negative. You don't have to use it. My feelings will not be hurt. <laughs> no, the book just in, you know, in a nutshell, they talk about five biases that we humans have that help us thrive in a world that doesn't change. It's the biases that help us learn how to ride a bike, right? We fall, we keep falling and then boom, we learn how to ride a bike and then we forget all the falls of the past. That's fine for, you know, things like learning how to ride a bike. But when we have to prepare for the next Hurricane Sandy, it doesn't help us to forget what happened. Not saying that New York didn't forget, but it is in our nature to be optimists, to think that these disasters are not going to hit us. So there's something interesting there. They argue, the book argues that we need to do a behavioral risk analysis and see what biases, because we don't all have the same amount of biases. So we have to do a behavioral risk analysis to understand what biases just play a bigger role in the decisions that we make and then target that bias when we prepare for disasters or a change in climate in general. Fantastic. I, and I, if I had to think about what I'm missing, you know, I've, I've acknowledged it a bunch is I have barely covered agriculture. Like I had like Monsanto mm. on like five or six years ago. And I, I don't know, there's this bias against, it. I don't know why. It just, of course, if people understand how I run the podcast, it's just this, it's or an organic process. And I'd also like to talk to maybe some groups doing adaptation in very conservative states or communities and how this kind of piecemeal approach they do to it. And so I think that would be interesting. It's just finding the you know, finding government people who could speak on the record in those kind of states is very difficult, but I, it's people just doing adaptation by the seat of their pants. That's going to be for the next 10, 20 years. And so it'd be kind of fun to focus on that. This is super fun for me to hear from you guys. It's just you're asking me questions, kind of behind the scene questions about the podcast. And I love talking podcasting. And when I meet my listeners, we, I get to talk about those kind of things. And so you guys were supposed to come up with some questions for me. Anita, we're going to start with you. Okay. Yeah. My question, I guess, has to do with what we were just talking about, sort of how, how do you decide what topics to cover, or, you know, who to include? I know it's a little bit random and ad hoc and opportunistic, which is great because it's been working out for you so well. But a couple of things that we've talked about over the years, Doug, that still sort of stick out to me. You And you mentioned earlier about communication and the importance of communication, getting it right, different forms of communication. So I'm wondering if you could do more on that subject in the coming year and reflect on who's doing it well, who's who could do it better, what different types of media do we need more, you know, popular films, 
on climate change, like don't look up? Do we need more popular books? What kind of books? I still want to revisit the idea of a America Adapts book club and share some reviews on books that are coming out. Monica mentioned one that she has read. I'm reading right now a book called Gray Rhino, which is all about not facing the obvious risks that we're facing. And it's got a psychological element to it. But there's a lot of climate fiction that I tried to review for you over the years, Doug. And, we, you know, it never quite worked out. But I think more attention on the different types of communication and the role that communication will play in successful adaptation going forward. And how can your podcast help facilitate, challenge, engage different kinds of communication? I think that would be fun and interesting. So if you'll get on that one, Doug, that would be good. So it's not so much a question, just sort of like do more climate communication kind of thing. Yeah. And how would you, how, how could you envision going about supporting different kinds of or probing different kinds of climate communication in order to advance adaptation? Is it books? Is it film? Is it scientist? Is it more podcasts? Like, how, yeah. how can we advance on doing better and more with communication around adaptation? Yeah, it's a good question. And, you know, I have covered it, not as frequently. You know, I have Amy Brady on talking about sci-fi, climate fiction, and I've done a Hollywood type episode. Yeah, uh, maybe just put some thought into like how that a, a structured way of doing that. And so I was critical of the National Resilience Framework. What would a communication strategy look like for them? And then podcasts could reflect around that. I'm obsessed with communicating adaptation. And so I just I kind of stuck to my, my role within the podcast, but there could be a bigger kind of shout out to do that. So yeah, that's good. Jessica. Well, yes. And now that I'm a podcaster as well, and Monica and I talk about, you know, what topics we want to cover and people we want to talk to, I have to know, like, have you ever gotten the cold brush off from somebody that you really wanted to be a guest on this show and they either rejected you rudely or it was just always the kind of putting you off? Like, is there someone out there that you've tried to get that has just been like, no, sorry, not interested? Yeah, it's coming to that. And there's one that just was like, they were, this is after I've been around for a while. They just, I'm not going to mention a name. That's just not good. But, and I'll mention names for these other examples, but just they do climate commentary and stuff and they just, oh, I'm too busy. And then, you know, it's like, I don't think they appreciated the audience that I represented that they don't really speak to. And so that was like my attitude now. It's like, you're missing out. You're missing out on my incredibly influential listeners. And so that rarely happens. But the, the, I mentioned this to Anita. I get pitches every single day, most of them un, not close enough to be on the podcast, but mm -hmm. someone who would pitch Alex Hunold. He remembered the climber who did Capitan was a solo. Was that? And so, right. I said, amazing. He went down to South America with a scientist and they had to climb up this thing to try to study some species barely related. But I'm like, it's Alex Hunnell. I'll have him on for 15 minutes. And I said, can I get him? And they're like, yeah, sure. And so the PR people are just, yeah, I want to strangle him in this that They're like, okay, we get him. And then they come back a couple of days later. Well, he's not available, but do you want the scientists? And I was quite clear. I'm like, not the knock the scientists. This is barely related. No. And so you got to, they just play with you that way. And Ken Burns, someone representing Ken Burns put this new Buffalo episode thing. He had Buffalo documentaries, mm. his newest mm. one. Ken Burns, his famous doc, again, not related to climate adaptation. I don't care. Get him on for 15 minutes, 20 minutes. And they're like, yes, we can get you Ken Burns, not the producer. Because they asked, do you want the producer? I'm like, no, I don't want the producer. I want <laughs> Ken Burns. And, you know, never heard from them again. And mm. it's just, they, they those PR people, they just, so I, and I have sometimes I have these back and forth that I probably shouldn't because the worst thing that they do, oh boy, you got me down a rabbit hole here is that they explain someone who's barely related and there's just like, so when can we schedule this interview with this guy? And I'm just like, I write like, when? I haven't even agreed to this. And they use that language and it's so oh. obnoxious. And when should we have this interview? I'm like, never, we're never going to have this interview. So <laughs> All right. But I, I, I ignore most of those. So Right. Well, I will tell you, that's a good problem to have, right? When you're so prominent that these people want to push their, I guess, their clients to be on your show. Monica, hopefully you and I someday will be able to complain about all the annoying PR people who keep bothering us, right? I'm manifesting that's that. That's right. Fingers crossed. <laughs> okay. Monica, you'll get on these PR, these media lists. You will get on eventually. If you get oh. produced like 10, 20 episodes, you should start. Someone adds you. I didn't add myself. But all right, Monica, oh. what's your question? I first want to second Anita's idea of having a book club. I think it's a great idea. But anyhow, my question is, I think your listeners, you have been at this for a couple of years now, maybe more than that. 
I think that would benefit from hearing how did the podcast get started? Yeah. I could tell you that story. (laughs) Do Do you even know this? Well, first off, the book club, I do books on occasion. It's just kind of exhausting to read a book and prep. The prep is just so hard. And so when Anita and I were talking about it, I'll get these books offered to me free and I've sent Anita, I think several now. And it's just like, it's on you. You got to read them and follow up with me. And I said, we'll have you on for 10 minutes to do a book. You are the, <laughs> you are the cog in that. So I have wait, wait, don't throw me under the bus here, Doug. I got one or two books. Send me more. I'm a slow okay. reader. I told you, but Monica and I will read them and we'll do a little review for you. That's my point though. Reading is slow. And so book club, usually there's a pattern and then you're just like, it just well, doesn't kind of come together. How about once a quarter? Yeah. Dude, I'll, you, two quarter. Take yeah. you take I ownership, read, approach me. Okay. Monica, I read the let's book do that it. He, let's do it, Anita. Okay. I read the book that he will kill you first too. Okay. Uh, that great. might be our first one. Super yeah. done. Too much, too much coverage. It's it's been over covered. I know Jeff Goodell, and he said that book was covered all summer long. You also have to kind of look out for things that are just. What's the new okay. thing here? We will bring you. Monica read the other ostrich book. I'm reading Gray Rhino. We will bring you some psychology, and that will be our little book. Club. Oh, this is going to be a hostile whole, interview. This will be hostile. It doesn't have to be so. a whole episode, Doug. It could just be a segment of an episode. We'll do one of these sort of 30-second TikTok video interviews. Tell me, oh, good, bad. Okay, next. Monica, your second point, it was the book club, and then it was, how how did I get started? Yeah, I was fired from my job, and I was unemployed. And so I was between jobs, and I was going to start my podcast at the previous job. And I'm like, well, you know, I got to keep my brain sharp as I'm looking for work. And I just, I knew a ton of people in the adaptation space, but more in the natural resource sector. And so after being out of work for two, three months, I'm like, I'm doing this. And I actually, I had the time (laughs) because I wasn't working. And yeah, it just, that was, you know, that sort of emergency situation caused it. And so I was doing the podcast as I was still looking for work and after two and three months discovering I was getting a listener base. And Jesse Keenan was really the first person who reached out. Like after three or four months, I knew I was up to something. It's like, he's like, Doug, big fan of the podcast. I'm a Harvard professor doing adaptation work. And I'm just like, Harvard professor is listening to my podcast. It was very exciting. So he came on and we've been really good friends and he's executive producer and he helps recruit guests and all sorts of things. And so that's the history. It was getting a let go of my previous job and just, having the idea before I even left that job. So there was nothing scandalous about me getting fired. I don't think I <laughs> That's that. it in people wanting scandalous. <laughs> so just don't, I want, why do you get fired? Anyway. I have another question for you. Okay. Are there any episodes that after they're done, maybe it's during the editing process or listening back before you publish it where you're like, oh, I just really do not, you know, we've been talking about our favorites and I don't expect you to name names, but are there ever any where you're like, oh, I just really did not like that. Either that guest or this topic or how this interview came together. Like, are there any of your own episodes that leave you with a little bit of a bad taste in your mouth for some reason? Well, of course, and I'm not going to mention those. But uh, okay. Maybe I'll tell you more broadly <laughs> that what really, if you want to kind of, that sounds so egotistical, but just getting on my bad side with You come on the podcast and then afterwards when it's published, you don't lift a finger to promote it in your network. And that is like, I'm having you on, I'm highlighting your work and I'm sharing you with all these amazing listeners and post on LinkedIn, share in newsletters and I'll put it on your website. And to some people, they move on. Maybe they do a lot of media, but it's just like, there's a lot of work as you guys have discovered. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of work that goes into production on the podcast. And so if they don't lift a finger to promote and I know that they're not, <laughs> that's just, it's, it's, not, it's not poor form, right? It's just, yeah. it's, and it doesn't actually require a lot of work to promote. And it's like, you're promoting yourself. What's the problem? So that's kind of, as a podcaster that you'll run into that. They're just like, mm-hmm. they think they're doing you a huge favor by coming on. And then mm-hmm. they don't play a role in promoting because I'm always interested in new networks because every mm-hmm. there's new listeners out there and each person has their own network. So. Hmm. Interesting. Did, did anyone have any more questions? I, we should probably wrap this up relatively soon. I was going to have a, like a fun couple questions here. Are we done? Anybody had any other behind the scenes questions? Raise your hand. Anything? I had a question regarding what is something that you want your audience to know? Like, I'm sure it crosses your mind when you hear back and where you don't hear back from your listeners. Like, I wish they knew X. But what do you mean? I don't understand what they are they about some adaptation issue or what do you mean? No, about the podcast. Oh, I wish 
I, and this is part of, you know, I, I get sponsored to do episodes. It's just, I, I think they get a sense of it when I talk about it, but I, I get so excited when I learn someone else who listens and what they do and some super influential people doing some amazing work. And for my listeners to appreciate that they're part of this community. So you might just be an urban planner in a small city, but then there might be someone high up in the white house who listens. And so you're all listening to this together and you're just a community and you're getting value out of it. And so just for my listeners to appreciate that they're part of this really cool community of adaptation people that it's a cool subject. It's an emerging subject and we can all really influence it either at the lowest level or at the highest level. So that's, I guess that's what I, I like to think. And I, when I hear from someone out of the blue, oh, I listen to your podcast and this is what I do. I'm like, that's so awesome. So yeah, and I'm always, you hear me at the end of every episode, reach out, contact me, let me know what you, keep up the great work adapters. I'll see you next time. <laughs> Excellent. So how can listeners reach out to you? Do they send you an email? Yeah, yeah. Just send me an email, americadapts at gmail.com. And yeah, uh, you can also support the podcast too. I have a we question, Doug. Yes. Have you received feedback from your listeners that has caused you to change anything in terms of how you do? podcast or think about the podcast yeah there was one ornery fella who didn't like as much chit chat as i had at the beginning of the podcast you know i had my introduction and so sometimes i think early on my first two or three years sometimes i might include it a little bit too much but part of my attitude too is just like i have housekeeping to do i have to sort of say this is where I'm going. I need you to do this or like, oh, think about supporting the podcast or whatever. And then I I say a lot of the same thing at the end of the episode because that's how I keep doing what I'm doing. And so I shortened some of the stuff because of that feedback. Listen, I get it. I know how I listen to podcasts too. It's like fast forward, fast forward. But it's just like, I got to have that information out there. And no, normally the introduction is new material. But I I think something more larger, critical of it, I, I don't think so. I, I like a lot of production stuff. No one complains about the audio quality and things like that, just because I put a lot of thought into that. So now nah, I can't think of anything else. I knew this goes on too long, but I here's a fun question. And if you could, and let's let's keep this short. Though we are toward the end here, but if you could recommend, we're going to go reverse it here. Recommend one guess that's not related to climate adaptation. She could be anyone. Super fun. It has to be alive. And just who would it be? And let's start with you, Monica. The psychologist from the Ostrich Paradox book. I'll send you his name. And bring Alice Hill back. Related to adaptation. She, yeah, I haven't oh, chatted okay. with Alice in, in, in a while, but she's she's fantastic. I saw her at the insurance conference. Okay. All right. So the book, the book guy. There's no celebrities or anything. All right. Go on. Anita? I would say Amanda Ripley. She's a journalist, a writer. She wrote a book called Catastrophe, Who Survives Disasters and Why. Fascinating, Monica. You would like it. And she writes about lots of different subjects, but I think she would be fantastic. Wow, those sound very serious. Okay, Jessica, you're up. I know. Well, okay, if you want my celebrity guest, I'll say my favorite like celebrity ever, Angelina Jolie, right? So I'll just give you that because okay. I think she's done interesting things. But otherwise, again, I would go to the journalist too. I would actually say Jessica Valenti. She's a journalist, a feminist sort of reporter kind of thing. But again, I think that's one thing even within climate change, we talk about vulnerable populations and all of that. And I think I'd be interested in hearing sort of a feminist take on this, the ways that women in a lot of ways are much more vulnerable to all these issues, right? Just because of built in um, structural sexism, misogyny, the patriarchy, whatever it is. So I'd be interested to hear you talk to someone like her, who's probably coming at this from a completely different perspective than what you're used to. Okay. I thought about this a bit too. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the comedian Martin Short. Yeah, yes. Three Amigos. I mean, he's just entertaining. Only murders in the building. I don't watch that. I watched tried a couple episodes. Eh. Anyway, I love him. He's just on talk shows. He's amazing for him to come on. He'd probably make fun of me the whole time. It would be awesome. And I'd also like to have. I'm going to add an extra one here too. Is like I, George Lucas, Star Wars guy. I would probably just spend 60 minutes just ripping him about the prequels. <laughs> These were awful. What's wrong with you? And you just ruined this whole thing. And I got a lot of anger around Star Wars. So yeah, that's what I'd like to do with my podcast. So All right, can I make a request? If you do get Martin Short on, will you ask him if he's dating Meryl Streep? Because that's the whole rumor. So I want to know. So ask him. Okay, I could break some news. Can I? Last can I? Can I do a redo? Jane okay. Fonda. 
Who? Jane Fonda. Ooh. Yeah, yeah, Jane yeah. Fonda is doing an amazing work in the climate space. So I think you should bring her to the podcast. I heard her speak at Green Build, which is a big, large conference in the building sector. She was a keynote speaker. She was fantastic, funny, insightful. All the good. What a, what a life, right? What I mean, she's a Vietnam protester and just all these actresses early. What a life for that woman. Now she's a big climate activist. Okay, last question. And it's going to be too late. I've been talking about this with Jesse. It's like, Thoughts on my 200th episode? Should I just, it's probably going to just be status quo things I have in the queue, but any sort of like swing for the fences kind of thing? Anita, any thoughts on that? Well, I understand John Kerry has some time on his hands now. Maybe he would mm-hmm. like to come on and pontificate about the future. Okay. Okay. That sounds good. Monica? Not sure I have ideas on speakers for the 200 episode, but I think you should make a big deal about it. I don't know, do a gathering of all your past speakers or do a, a, a party, a celebration. Find some sponsors for that. <laughs> I like it. That's though. right. I love it. Put a shout out of there for sponsors too. Jessica, great idea though. I like that. This might be too hard, but I'd be really curious to see if there was some way, that's probably way too hard unless you had a production assistant, to kind of see even how as climate change and the discussion around adaptation has changed over the what the past five or 10 years, if you could see any of those changes in your podcast, even maybe how you cover this or how people were speaking about some of this when you first started to now. I think that might be too hard, but I love that idea of kind of like using your podcast as a snapshot of some of the developments in this space over the past few years. It could be just a graduate student's sort of like, you know, a social experiment, just analyzing the episodes. I was actually trying to get, I was getting some help from an AI expert on Mm -hmm. how to use some AI tools to analyze all 197 episodes, look for patterns and all that, but it's just, it's too complicated to get the transcripts and all that stuff. But I, I would love that sort of assessment too. And you know, yeah, I like those things. I just want to go around. Any final thoughts, just plugs for what you're doing or like if people want to reach out to you, anything like that. So Anita, any like final thoughts? Well, I'm delighted to hear that Jessica and Monica have their own podcasts. I will be a listener of that. And I would love to get input from both of you on an episode that I'm doing with T- Doug that will come out shortly on the workforce of the future because I'm kept awake at night thinking about who are all these adaptation workers, who are all these so-called nature-based solution workers and professionals? How do they get trained? How how are they accessing education? What do we need to do as professionals in our own institutions to train the next generation of practitioners in the space? So Doug and I are working on that podcast. I'll put a shameless plug in for that now and perhaps can convince both of you to join us in that discussion. (laughs) Okay. Monica, any final thoughts? Keep on going. Keep doing the good work. Thank you for your help with our podcast. And then our third and last shameless plug to listen to Adapt Climate Change in the Built Environment. Shameless. Okay, Jessica, you want to continue the shamelessness? Yes, yes. Adapt. Climate change in the built environment available on all major podcast platforms. But otherwise, I will say, and it's funny, I saw somebody posting this somewhere else. It was actually like a Wisconsin politician. Or no, it was actually a law professor who's actually very prominent in copyright law. But talking about LinkedIn has actually become, in some ways, like the best social media platform for a lot of discussions, and especially in this climate change and construction and built environment and ESG area, there's, I meet a lot of interesting people on there. So I would just ask anyone, yeah, who's interested in reaching out to me. I'm the only Jessica Meterson. So just, you know, search for me on LinkedIn and start a conversation because I like to hear and like to learn. I like to learn. Actually, I'm still a newbie to this whole area. So there's so many people out there that I can learn from. So that would be my other plug. And I can include that your LinkedIn on the show notes for this episode too, easy enough for them to look down at that. Hey, y'all. Thank you for joining me for this episode. Fantastic. You guys are rock stars. I love doing these episodes. I love just hearing the feedback on the podcast. Obviously, it's a little indulgent, but it's fun too. And these episodes are always very popular. So thanks again for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Hey, Adapters. Joining me is Dr. Rafiwe Mofoken. She started a brand new podcast and we're here to learn a bit more about it. Hey, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. All right. I know I just brutalized your name. And so for my listeners, can you just give us the correct pronunciation (laughs) just for the record? 
But it's really simple, really. It's refilue. So it's refilue. Yeah. So that's that's all there is to it. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you. First off, where are you based? I am based in South Africa, in Cape Town, South Africa, at the University of, of Stellenbosch. But our podcast really just targeted everyone, you know, first within the global south and then also connecting with the global north. All right. Fantastic. And we'll get to the podcast, but I just want to learn a little bit more about you. You're a scientist there. <laughs> and what do you do there? What's your focus area? So my background is marine biology. I specialized in ecotoxicology, which is everything pollution, basically. So I, I work with uh, heavy metals, pesticides, microplastics, the works. So anything that sort of contaminates the environment, the marine environment in particular, and estuarine environments, that's, that's pretty much me. And so we were put in touch by a common colleague, and here we are now, we're going to do this podcast because I want to expose people to what you're doing there. I'm very excited about this podcast that you've created, and you are well into it. But tell us first, what's the podcast's name? The name of our podcast is the Plastic Planet Podcast. We just discuss everything plastic. So yeah, so everything that is related to plastic, plastic pollution, and plastic contaminants and everything that is associated with that, that's what we we speak on. Why did you start the podcast? What inspired you to use a podcast as a medium to kind of get your message out? Sure. The plastic planet is actually a word that or term that came with, you know, our common colleague or, you know, just the person who really just brought us together. And it was just as a result of, you know, my frustration of, you know, speaking to the converted and really just finding myself conference after conference in the same room with people that like I identify with. And it was everybody was speaking to everyone else. And there was not really a progress or like a form of progress that we were seeing. So uh, I, I, I just thought a podcast would be a great platform to enable Everyone who's not in the science sector, for instance, to speak to, to, to one another and to engage and to understand what, what challenges they have in the regarding plastics with, with regards to plastic pollution and how they're mitigating them and really just get solutions that are meaningful. So that is, that is how it all started. Exciting. I'm always, I love when a new podcaster comes on the scene and this is an important topic. And so give us a flavor of a couple episodes. What are some of the things, I mean, you talk to people and what are the really, how do you dig at, dig down into a particular episode? So we are on episode 12 and it's still very early days. And I'm, I'm excited every time I speak to a new person or a new guest. And we've had just diverse guests from scientists to journalists and, and lawyers. And uh, yeah, so we hoping to speak to a politician soon. So just really getting a feel of what people think about the, the topic from people who feel like, it's, it's a trivial thing. It's not a big issue to, to ones that really understand the gravitas of the situation and just who have their sort of know-how and ideas and innovation measures that they have in place. So really just getting a diversity of voices that really speak on this issue has been, has been really just mind opening for me. And I've learned a lot and I'm continuing to learn a lot. For my listeners, what I recommend you do, and 12 episodes, that's fantastic. You made it past the f famous, if you get, get past three or four, you're well on your way. And so some of the early episodes, and I'm just going to say the titles here just because I want to give people a sense. If you want to get grounded in this topic, there's the introductory podcast, but then like the second episode is what are microplastics if you really don't understand what that is and then impacts on physiology and you're getting the fundamentals. But what I think is fantastic as I look at these things is that you truly are getting a worldwide perspective. You have the Nigerian perspective, you have no Norwegian perspective, there's an the Indian yeah. perspective, and I imagine you're going to be going around the world and getting so many different perspectives, right? Yeah, that's the plan. I think what really inspired this was that, again, we're speaking in silos and the global south is speaking to the global south and the global north is speaking to the global north and there's not 
this connection that's happening. And I, I just have this opportunity to go around these amazing conferences and find and, and meet up with people that are in the decision making spaces that have the know-how and the ability to, to really make the, the changes. And with, with COP28 coming along, I, I think it's a, it's a really good opportunity to really get people's voices and ideas out there so that we have more than one voice and one medium that uh, tackles such issues. It's been out long enough. What's the feedback been? Have you been hearing from listeners? They've been kind of coming out of the woodwork? Yeah, I think people love it. I think I've had it shared within my community. I've had it, I've had people share it amongst themselves as well and recommend it to one another. So it's encouraging that there is some positive feedback and it's also a learning opportunity for people who really don't, don't understand the concept and why is, is plastic such an issue? And it's, that is not just plastic. You just alluded to plastics and physiology. What is impact of plastic in your physiology. We're finding microplastics in our bloodstreams, in our placentas. And what does that mean really for the human species? So topics such as those from what happens when, what is your relationship with plastic even? I, I'd like to believe that everyone has had in contact or just interaction with plastic at some point in their lives. And they would have an answer to this question. Do you have a healthy relationship with plastic? Do you think it's bad? Do you think it's good? You know, what is it? So just really trying to understand this commodity and see how we can just implement it in a sustainable manner moving forward. I'm with you when I go to the grocery store and I see people walking out of there with like 20 plastic bags for 22 wow. items. It just breaks my heart because I bring my own bag. <laughs> but there's I use plastic and all sorts of things. It's obviously an incredibly useful thing too, but we use too much of it. And as scientists like you are, are sharing, it's out in places we can't even imagine. So I'm, I'm very happy you're out there spreading the word. And if people want to find your podcast and listen to it, what do you recommend? I recommend that uh, it's on Spotify and also Apple Podcasts. So you can just tune in on the Plastic Planet podcast and uh, follow the topic. And uh, yeah, just really have comments, have feedback. And we really would love to have your feedback. We're still growing and we're still learning. As you would know, science is a very closed up field and trying to open up to the public it has its challenges or comes with its challenges, both internally and externally. But we are here to just break those barriers particularly with the young sort of scientists that are coming up. They just still up a dynamic and they do things a tad bit differently. So just really trying to change that trajectory and hopefully it will be a, a positive outcome. Fantastic. Congratulations on the podcast. I'm very excited for you. You're going to find that people come from all sorts of places and doing really interesting things that'll find your podcast. So I think it's going to be an exciting time for you. And maybe let's get you back on an episode 100. So that's a commitment that you're going to keep doing yeah. this for a long time. So let's com commit to that. I'm all for that. And thank you so much for what you're doing. And thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. And yeah, thank you to your listeners as well. And I'm looking forward to their feedback. Hey Adapters, I'm with Stephen Robert Miller. Stephen is the author of a new book, Over the Seawall, Tsunami, Cyclone, Drought, and the Delusion of Controlling Nature. Welcome to the podcast, Stephen. Thanks a lot, Doug. Thanks for having me. All right, we're here to talk about this book that is now out. But first off, tell us a little bit about yourself. Who are you? I'm an environmental journalist based in Colorado. I grew up in Arizona, but I write mostly about climate change, adaptation, wildlife conservation. I write a lot about agriculture, and I write for magazines like National Geographic. I write for the Washington Post, Discover, The Guardian. I was a Ted Scripps fellow at the University of Colorado, and I also teach some classes there on science writing and feature writing. Let's talk about this book, and this description gives us away a lot, and you're not tiptoeing around what you're trying to say here, but give us some context there. Give us a 30,000-foot view of what this book is about, and then we'll dig into it a little bit more. So this book is about the unintended consequences of adaptation to climate change. And really, it's about you know what happens when we rush into solutions. I've kind of pigeonholed myself into being like the anti-solutions guy lately. But what I'm seeing is as we're all feeling the effects of climate change now in a very immediate way, there's this rush to hurry up and adapt and to protect ourselves from that. And it makes sense. But what this book is about is what can happen when we make the wrong decisions, when we make short-sighted decisions, and how sometimes the decisions that we make now can echo for generations, or even right now, just for people who aren't nearby that we don't even think about. 
tell us a bit about the process of writing it. So you traveled quite a bit to get the material for the book? I did. I was had to do it during the pandemic, so that was a whole logistical hassle. But you know, the book takes place primarily in three locations in Japan, in the northeastern part of Tohoku, out in Bangladesh, particularly in the southwestern coastal region, and then in where I grew up in southern and central Arizona. Can you provide an example from your book that illustrates how well intentioned solutions, and I'm assuming more of these engineering solutions to climate have really backfired? Give us one or two examples. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the really simple ones is like air conditioning. That's something that you probably heard of before, how running air conditioners to try to avoid the heat, actually, as long as we're using fossil fuels to power those air conditioners, ends up generating heat, you know, adding to the heat by uh, generating more fossil fuel emissions. That's a simple one. And when I was in Bangladesh, I encountered one on a much larger scale. And this was an attempt that we see actually a similar thing happening with the Mississippi Delta here in the States. But the Ganges Delta is one of the largest deltas in the world. And there, for centuries, people have tried to control hundreds of very dynamic rivers that have naturally ebbed and flowed and moved in their tidal rivers and move with the Bay of Bengal. And people have been trying to hold those rivers in place with these huge embankments and levees that run on for miles. And unfortunately, what has happened without realizing it at first is those embankments have caused these rivers to silt up so that they're filling with sediment rather than the sediment being uh, deposited over the Ganges Delta Plain. And so what's happened now is what used to be a seasonal, small and manageable floods has evolved into huge catastrophic floods that happen less frequently. But when it does happen, it's a real disaster. Uh, and this is directly attributed two centuries of efforts, but really the last few decades, efforts to control rivers that would otherwise be free-flowing and meandering. I haven't have read the book yet. And so you're focusing, I think, on projects that have already happened. Are there any engineering projects that are in the works that are making you nervous, I guess you might have become aware of as you were um, writing this book? Absolutely. And that's the reason I wrote this book was to help inform people of these things that have happened in the past so that we might recognize them when they come home to us today. You know, and there's, you know, seawalls being proposed all around the U.S. coastline, whether it's Miami or San Francisco or New York. One of the early projects that really caught my eye, maybe you want to write about this, was a project that the Army Corps of Engineers had proposed to protect New York City after uh, Hurricane Sandy. The idea there was to build a six mile long wall that would span the Hudson Bay. And critics came out of the woodwork to complain about how, you know, it would, it would affect migrating marine life. It could affect the flow of the Hudson River. It could cause sewage to actually back up and it would actually cause uh, people to, it, it could, increase floods, especially in low-income communities around New York City. So the, kind of one of the uh, way I look at it was in, in one way, New Yorkers were faced with this question of whether they were willing to stew in their own filth because of the backed up sewer, sewage water behind a wall that would ultimately end up being too short to really protect them from any serious storms by the time it was finished because of the increasing rate of sea level rise. So that was, I think, one of the most ex obvious examples in happening in a big city. Another big one that caught my eye, especially being from Arizona, is this constant talk that's been going on there for decades now, but you know, continues about building a massive pipeline that would bring water from like the Mississippi River, or Missouri River, the Great Lakes down to Arizona, or to building huge desalination plants down in the Baja California in Mexico and desalinating water from the Sea of Cortez and piping it up to Arizona to feed farms and cities there. Each of these projects sounds kind of ridiculous, but we have to remember there is a history of doing things that at one time sounded ridiculous in the desert. You know, I don't know if you've been following, but the idea of a pipeline from the Mississippi, they've had some drought and the water's not flowing as much. And they're actually having issues of the water, uh, I guess, the, the water supplies for New Orleans, that it's getting saltwater intrusion. Have you heard about that? I have. Absolutely. Yeah. It's just, it's just <laughs> that I don't think we're getting a pipeline from the Mississippi when you have things like that going. So. No, maybe not. But I mean, it's crazier things have been suggested. And we do have a pipeline from, you know, from the Colorado. And they've talked about one from the Columbia River. And they've talked about floating icebergs down the Pacific coast from Alaska down to Arizona. I mean, these all sound ridiculous and totally you know, outlandish at a time. But I think it is w worth keeping in mind that like, sometimes all it takes is a big disaster and somebody with enough money. And suddenly these things start to look realistic. Okay, so you've been a listener of my podcast, right? Yeah. So I'm not sure if you've listened to enough episodes, but have there been episodes where you're thinking when people are doing adaptation that your hypothesis for this book is that maybe this maladaptation, we need to think about it more. Did you have your own sort of reactions like, OK, maybe these guys aren't right. They sound like they're being proactive and yet they're probably maybe not doing something that they shouldn't be doing. 
And one of the most obvious examples, I think, is th- or something like cloud seeding, you know, geoengineering, something that comes up a lot in conversations around adaptation. And it's one of those engineering and scientific you know, chemistry problems that wonks, you know, and scientists will just explore because it's interesting and it's fascinating to, we, we learn things in the process of trying to explore this, but then in process, once it's actually put into place and in the real world, it can, we suddenly run into issues where it has huge devastating impacts down the line. Like it causes, you know, it, it doesn't, maybe it solves a drought in one area, but it causes a problem and a, a deluge in a different area, which causes flooding where people aren't prepared for it or the opposite effect where it actually causes drought in a different area. You know, I think that's an example where people are, talks about adaptation, they get ahead of themselves and really run into some potential risks. All right. So you have been following the adaptation space for a while. You write about it. How is your book relevant to my listeners? Your listeners are aware of all these different schemes for adaptation, right? That your listeners are following plans all around the country. I think there's propensity among people who are aware of this stuff to kind of to jump into ideas that they think are going to be the quick fixes or they the think that they think are the most ec- economically or, or engineering wise feasible. It doesn't necessarily mean they're the best. And I think an area that sometimes gets lost in some of these adaptation conversations is the environmental justice aspect of it. So that's something that I wanted to bring to the adaptation space to t- kind of take it out of the world of just engineering and to take it into the world of humanity and to think about how some of these engineering marvels will actually play out in the lives of real world people. And these are not just people like right in, you know, down the road from us today or our neighbors. Sometimes these are people generations down the road or countries over. That's something that I want to address with this book is to really, to bring it home to to realization that these decisions we make now are going to have downstream impacts on human lives. What's next for you and how can people find your book? Book is available on Amazon, on Barnes and Noble, and bookshop.com. Uh, there'll be an audiobook available soon, and you can get the Kindle version. What's next for me is to continue writing and banging on this topic. Something about writing a book is you end up with way more information than you could even end up putting in a book. Uh, and so now I've got plenty of stories, magazine articles that I would like to write to kind of keep hammering on this. And I want to keep kind of spreading the gospel of slow adaptation in a sense. Like, I think my mantra has become that, you know, I say this in the book, but adaptation is not a solution. It's a process over time. And I think that's something that's really important for the adaptation world to, con- to keep in mind. Like, I'm not looking for fixes. I'm not looking for solutions. I'm looking for new systems and new ways of thinking about protecting ourselves and adapting that are going to allow us to be malleable, to be ever-changing so that we can adjust on the fly. Because climate change is not something that's just going to happen and then you know move on. It's going to be something that continuously happens for a long time to come. So I'll be banging on that door as long as anybody's willing to listen to me talk about it. All right, Stephen, congratulations on the book. It's an important subject and good luck with what you're doing. Thanks a lot, Doug. I appreciate you taking the time. Hey, Adapters, that is a wrap. Thanks to everyone who participated in this episode. Anita and Monica have been on before, but thanks to Jessica for joining them in the fun and for taking over hosting duties briefly. I was able to take a break. I love being able to relax in these episodes, and hopefully you guys appreciate a little behind-the-scenes discussion. And it's also useful to hear what episodes really resonated with folks. Please contact me. Let me know what a favorite 2023 episode was for you. And congrats to Jessica and Monica on their new podcast, Adapt, Climate Change in the Built Environment. It's exciting to get some company in the adaptation podcast space. I remember when they first brought this up like a year ago and here they are publishing some great content links are in my show notes go check out and follow and congrats to dr rafil fay and her plastic planet podcast we were introduced by a common colleague about a year ago and she and i got on a zoom call and brainstorm about a potential podcast i love helping out future podcasters but it's often just too difficult to get off the ground and i remember telling her once you have a few episodes circle back around and we'll do a plug on my podcast You know, usually I don't hear from folks after this moment, but she came back with almost a dozen episodes covering some really important work. Please go check out our podcast. It's fantastic to see South Africa representing in the podcast space. And thanks to Stephen Miller Robert for sharing a sampling of his new book. That too is in my show notes. Don't forget to register for ICR 24 Innovations in Climate Resilience, hosted by Patel in Washington, D.C. in April. I'll see you there. Okay. I say this in every episode, reach out. We talked about it in this episode. Send me an email, tell me a favorite episode, recommend a guest, and definitely share how the podcast benefits what you do. It's incredibly important for me as I plan ahead. I'm at americadapts at gmail.com. And what is your adaptation story? Do people that you engage with understand what is climate adaptation? Most people don't. 
Are you finding that webinars and white papers aren't really resonating in ways that promote your work? Well, consider telling your story in a podcast. If you're interested in highlighting your adaptation story, consider sponsoring a whole episode of America Apps. Sponsoring a podcast allows you to focus on the work you're doing and sharing with climate professionals from around the world. I go on location for some of these to record, which allows you a wider diversity of guests to participate. You'll work with me to identify experts that represent the amazing work you're doing. Some of my partners in this process have been Battelle. World Wildlife Fund, Harvard University, UCLA, Natural Resources Defense Council, Environmental Defense Fund, and various corporate clients. It's a chance to share your story with all my listeners who represent the most influential people in the adaptation sector. Most projects have communications written to them. Consider budgeting in a podcast. Podcasts have long shelf lives, much more so than a white paper or a conference presentation. Many groups work into the communication strategies. If you work for a foundation, maybe you want to highlight the adaptation work you're doing there or the grantees that you're funding. There is no better platform than this podcast to get the word out on adaptation to some of the most influential and active adaptation professionals in the world. And if you're interested in having me keynote speak at your conference or corporate event, please reach out. More and more sectors are realizing they need to start thinking about climate adaptation. And for many in those fields, they have very little exposure to resilience and adaptation planning. I can speak to this issue and help you create awareness in your sector. Okay, adapters, keep up the great work. I'll see you next time.